edition of the Learning Lunch. And today we have a very special guest in our midst. She's a very humble person, but she's a very special uh, person in our midst today. She's a medical doctor and uh, she's a member of the Royal College of General Practitioners and as well as also the, a member of the Royal College of Pediatrician and Child Health. And also while she was in medical school, she also did um, a, dig a BSA degree in radi uh, radiological science intercalated, um, intercalated. So I think that's a kind of another degree that she has apart from uh, being a medical doctor. That's one fantastic thing about medicine, about people who study medicine. They, had, they, always, have a, they always give them time to do all the courses. Today we have in our midst Dr. Tolu Seiki and she's going to be sharing a journey with us today and tell us about the world of medicine and what it would take for you to uh, start a journey in that pathway also. And I believe that today you will learn a lot from her. You will really, really, truly learn a lot from her today. So I'm going to hand over without, without wasting time. I'm going to hand over to Dr. Seiki to take the floor. So Dr. Seiki, oh. you can start. Hey. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Dagmandru, for that uh, introduction. Yes, I'm Tolu Saiki. I've been a doctor now, going to 16 years, um, and it's gone by very quickly. Like they say, time flies when you're having fun. It's been fun, and yeah, it's been a, it's been a good journey. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about um, myself and also about being a doctor. I think some a lot of the people listening or watching this presentation are somewhere between their GCSE year and their A levels. So I'll just you know start my journey from there. And um, so I'll be starting with the background of you know being a doctor, what does that mean? And what it means in different ways. And then I'll talk about what I how I came to being a doctor and also what you would need if you're thinking of that career. Um, so um, I currently work in Essex as a GP, a general practitioner there. Um, I studied in King's College London, um, uh, did my MBBS, which is a medical degree in, in King's College. And while I was there, I also did a intercalated BSc, which you get the opportunity to do if you choose to in some universities. Some universities you have to, uh, but in King's College you get a choice to to do it if you want to. Um, and uh, current and then I went on to do some pediatrics and currently uh, work in general practice, which is shown there. I'm a member of the Royal College of Pediatrician and Child Health, as well as member of the Royal College of General Practitioners. So being a doctor, what does that mean? When someone say, I'm a doctor, what do you imagine they're doing? So that can mean a lot of different things. Because in, in, in being a doctor or in medicine, you can be working in so many different fields or in so many different ways and in so many different specialty, which is the way, way it's described. So on my screen here, this is just a limited, um, broad, uh, broad categories of how you could be working as a doctor. So we've got medicine, which is the general hospital doctor you would see. Um, you know, if you've got if someone is ill, maybe with a pneumonia or something, they end up in hospital. You know, they'll see somebody maybe in a &E or they go on the ward. So generally you've been looked after the, by, they call it the medics, which is just people in the med med medicine is the specialty. So um, then you have the other branch, which is a massive branch as well, uh, which is surgery specialty. On the surgical specialty, you've got, can you imagine all the different parts of your body. No one is good enough to operate on all the parts. So all the different areas have their own specialty. So you've got the eye specialist, the ophthalmology surgeon, you've got the orthopedic surgeon that deals with the bone, you've got the ENT, ear, nose and throat surgeon that deals with the throat. You've got just the head and neck surgeon. So it's like, if I want to go into all the details, we'll be here till tomorrow, so I wouldn't, but just to give a flavor. So the different areas, you've got 
surgeons that deal with just the, you know, the if you have an appendix, for example, they deal with all the bowels and stuff like that. So um, the next one on there is the obstetrics and gynecology, which is also like women health. So the obstetrician will deal with like the pregnant woman, everything to do with having a baby delivery or if there's any complications and all that. So that's a specialty. And the gynecologist is with all the other women problem. That's not necessarily to do with having a baby. Um, then the next one along on the top line in psychiatry, you know, so the psychiatrist to deal with your mind, things like severe depression, if somebody has like a bad mental health or severe cases, because a lot of these, all these things here can be dealt with by the general practitioner, but when you need a specialist in hospital, then you will see a psychiatrist if it's to do with your mind. You have the pediatrician there. This is something I was doing before I moved on to um, general practice. So everything to do with children, babies from day one up until 16 to 18. Um, so that's the, the specialty there. And within that, you can imagine if you're doing pediatrics, children are, also have all the different specialties within them. So moving on to pathology, which is um, a doctor most of us don't get to actually see or meet because they tend to deal with things, do things like autopsies. And when some people joke that that's usually when it's too late, but it's still very useful because you, when people die, suddenly you want to know why they died. Um, all this, you know, every time people are counting COVID deaths. So how do we know it's definitely COVID? Sometimes we know before they die, but sometimes someone dies and someone needs to investigate why they die so the pathologists would do that not just that they deal with pathologies basically study of diseases so they deal with they look at you know in there they think some some of the pathologies do deal with like microbiology of the bacteria side of things and the viruses and some of them do more of the autopsies so you can imagine there's different fields in there and the general practitioner is um knows that's the, if you're going to see your doctor at your GP surgery, that's usually the person you would see. So they would have a wide knowledge, not as in-depth, because all the other branches are deep, have the depth. So they have a wide knowledge and they can, you know, deal with everyone, babies, men, women, children, um, and in all the different areas, but then knowing when to pass on or refer to somebody else. Um, second to the last on my list here is public health. So with public health, they look at the health of the population. You know, people that study the trends. You know, you know, they study the the health of the of the population. So if with especially with um, COVID outbreak that has been going on over a pandemic going on at the moment, people are looking at okay, it's going up, it's going down. Why is it? What can we do to the health of the population? You don't have not necessarily individual people, but as a whole. So, OK, things like childhood obesity is going up. Why is that? Diabetes is, is it's one person's managing one person's diabetes or so that group. But why are we having more diabetes as a group? So looking at the medicine from that point of view. And at the bottom there, just put that there, just in case there's one young person who really loves sports and also really like medicine or thinking about the two. So, for example, all the teams, Chelsea, um, Olympic teams, all these people have their team doctor. So someone that would help them, for example, when someone is injured on the, on the court or on the field, the people that would attend to them there, the people that look after the health of the, uh, of the, of the sports, sports, person on or off the field so that's the that branch of um, sports medicine and you need to qualify as a doctor and then go into that so that's just a brief overview and what would that look like just a picture slide here of what that can look like so so this could I mean the doctor here could just be any doctor really um, here would be this would be a pediatrician could be a general practitioner looking after a child the gentleman here 
could be a psychiatrist. The, the one in the middle here is, most, is a microbiologist or a pathologist with them in the lab with the microscope. That's a sports um, medicine, especially helping the gentleman do some weight training. Um, yeah, the surgeons there you can see at the bottom there. And this is a doctor, you know, work, working remotely on the phone. For example, when you call 111, there's a doctor on the phone that you can speak to. Um, and this, the, down below here, you've got the a general practitioner speaking to a, a young woman about, could be anything really. So, you know, just, just, just a, a picture. So when I say I want to be a doctor, it could be any of this field. And you could move between them as well. So getting into medicine or getting into medical school. Um, so I, some of us would have done our uh, GCSEs or maybe we're thinking about doing it. So the journey really starts there. So all the hard work of studying, trying to get good grades, as many nines as you can, it's going to be it's going to be worth it if you're thinking about medicine because it's very competitive. So you want to give your vet self the best um, chance by you know, scoring the highest grade you can get. You definitely need GCSE maths and English and the sciences, single sciences. So maths, English, the physics, chemistry, biology and all the subjects that you want to do. Um, the important thing is to get as many um, nines as possible. But even if you don't get if you don't get all nines or there's a mix, that's fine. I didn't get all nines. I didn't get anywhere close to that. Um, and I still got in. So but so it's possible. So don't give up. But if you're still, if you have not done a GCSE yet, <laughs> give it your best. So going on to A levels, um, you definitely need to do A level chemistry. That is compulsory for to get into medicine anywhere in the UK. The other subject you want to do is biology. Um, a lot of universities is compulsory, some it's not. Um, and then the third one can be any anyone really. You can choose choose a subject that is not too difficult and that you can score, that you enjoy doing and that you can score a very good grade. You can get an A star in, that would be great. So you generally need at least three A's at um, A levels. Um, if you get A, some, some very competitive universities like Oxford, Cambridge, some of them require A stars or A stars and two A's. So you want to give it your best, you know, exam time, use it to really give it your best so that it will pay. And that's the result you're going to keep and you continue to use anyway. So the other thing, which is, I could say relatively new, because I didn't have to do this part, is the other examination, entrance exam for to apply for medicine. You have the UCAT, the UK um, assessment and the BMAT. So generally a lot of people who want to study medicine do both because some universities like Cambridge, Oxford, Imperial, I don't have the exact list in my head, but at least those three require BMAT, which is a Cambridge exam. And a lot of all the other universities, most of the other ones require UCAT um that's the, the, the top one so you know there's a lot of resources out there that goes into details and all the universities you need to check out what they want what they their requirements are and for this exam is to get into medicine and to get into dentistry um, and also for bmat you can use it to get into other like biomedical science subjects as well so that's all the exam and academic side of things at the top so coming down, what else do we need to get in? So really, to get into medicine, you are, you, apart from the academic side, studying medicine is more than just academics. There's also, you want to demonstrate that you are really committed to doing medicine, that you're really interested in it, in it because it's, it's, it can be a tough career, so you have to be sure. And when, the other thing you do in addition to your application and exam is that you would you have an interview for to get into medical school that is a lot of other courses you don't necessarily interview to get in 
for medicine, you will be interviewed and the interviews vary. Some interviews are you have like a traditional interview with a panel, a few people and they talk to you. Some of them, they run it like stations. So you have about five to seven stations where you they give you different scenarios and then you go in and have a conversation. So you go into one room, it might be about ethics, you have a conversation there. You come out, you go into the next one, it might be different scenarios. And, you know, so there is an interview. <clears throat> so in preparing for that side of things and for the personal statement, they want you want to show that you are really interested. So you get a work experience. I know at GCSE, yeah, most people get a week of work experience, which you can do in GP surgeries and um, in hospitals. With COVID-19, it's a bit tricky getting work experience and some people's work experience may have been cancelled. Um, but, you know, you can get exp work experience with St. John's Ambulance as well. Um, I would say the long, a week, it's okay, but it doesn't really demonstrate, and everybody does a week of work experience somewhere. A week is okay, but longer shows more commitment. I mean, um, I'll, I'll go into my story later, so I don't want to... I'll mention that again. So the longer the work experience, the better. So if you're doing some voluntary work somewhere where you do, <coughs> excuse me, where you go there for an hour or two hours a week over a period of six months, one year, you know, that's just commitment because you keep going back, you're learning. Um, so it's good to get a work experience. What is more important also is what is your reflection? What did you get out of the work experience? So some people will recommend you keep a diary, make a note. So what are you learning while you're there? And then the personal statement uh, is basically you selling yourself in a very limited number of words. So that you, you want to convince um, the people that you are interested in medicine. Um, there's, there's a whole area to look into. So, but if you start thinking about, okay, I want to apply for medicine soon, why would they choose me, not the next person? Because it's competitive, there's a whole lot more applicants than um, spaces. So why me instead of the next person? So you want to think about what, what do I have to offer medicine what do i have to offer the university so all your um first of all you want to talk about why how you came to your decision maybe based on your work experience based on speaking to doctors based on reading books reading journals your interests have grown over time so you want to express that um the other thing is um also what skills do you have which we'll talk about some skills that are required so those are things you put in your um, personal statement Let's so talking about my journey. Um, it's for me, it was a childhood dream, really, because um, some people say, oh, if you say I was ill and I was in hospital and because of that, I want to be a doctor, that is a bit cliche. But if it's, if it's true, you can't do nothing against the truth. <laughs> in my case, I had asthma as a child and I was in hospital quite a bit. And, you know, it, that was where my interest started. And then I got more exposed as I, um, my brother went into, went to medical school that was in Nigeria. Uh, for GCSEs, I did my GCSE in Nigeria because I went to school in Nigeria at the time and I started medical school in Nigeria. Um, there you just needed your GCE actually, it's not GCSE, but it's equivalent and you do another exam. So I got in, but then relocated to the UK after about six months, and I had to start over and did A-levels. So my GCSEs were nothing like nine A stars or 10 A stars. I think I had about seven papers altogether with about three A's in it. My English, when it was converted, was a C. And um, yeah, so, Talk about starting on the back foot. <laughs> but one thing I had was I already saw myself as a doctor because I'd already started. So it wasn't like that's all I wanted to do. So I think 
if it's something you really want to do, which is where the work experience, speaking to people, reading, searching comes in Andy, then the, you know, the road will open um, if you really, really are passionate and that's what you really want to do. So I did um, A levels, I did maths, chemistry and biology um, at A levels and I had three A's. I didn't apply in my second year just because when you apply for your GC, for your medic for through UCAS for your uh, um, application to medical school, a lot of the academic judgment is based on your GCSEs and your predicted grades. In my case, my GCSEs was not, it was not good enough, um, but I knew that I could actually work on my A levels, so that's why I got my A levels first before applying, and so I had three years at A levels, took a gap year to get work experience, travelled, um, and then applied. I my G, Because my GCSE wasn't good, so during my A-levels, I did my GCSE English again. So by the time I was applying, I had the, at least I had the, the minimum requirement, which is the English, and I had my three A's at A-levels. At the time, which is a while ago, um, there was no UCAT or BMAT, so um, I went on to King's College London. I made it sound easy. Initially, I got all rejections. Well, I got some interviews, but I was so nervous and so no confidence, could not speak to anyone. Uh, let me, <laughs> one thing comes to mind. I remember going to, because in my college, they helped us to organize a, um, what's it called, work experience in Royal London Hospital. The, the, my, t my tutor liaised with the volunteer coordinator over at Royal College, Royal London Hospital. Um, and uh, she invited, invited me over to come. I sat in the chair like this, you know, and I was so timid and nervous just for a voluntary, <laughs> volunteer post that the woman couldn't tell me that she couldn't give it to me because I was just like, she can't talk. <laughs> so she told my tutor and she said, well, I don't think she will manage. She can't talk. She's like that. Anyway, I, um, they gave me, I went back and I started, did voluntary work and then I did for two years and it was amazing. I went to the hospital every, I can't remember what day of the week, weekday evening, dinner time, somewhere between five and seven, help with their meals. Speak, spoke to different patients on the ward, just general. And that was one of, apart from putting it on my personal statement, it would help me um, because it really helped me my com develop my communication skills, just getting comfortable with talking to whoever that's on the ward, the nurses, healthcare assistant, you know. So that was, um, so if you're timid and can't communicate and you don't have confidence, there's still hope. <laughs> It can, they are all skills that can be developed and learned. Um, so I think that, yeah, so I went on to, so I did have a couple of interviews, which I didn't get, and I think I, I was just too nervous for the interview. But then I went through clearing, so don't give up. I went through clearing. I remember submitting my rights to all the universities in the UK, and then I wanted to go to King's. Uh, so I hand delivered my letter to King's College Hospital. I went to the, I think by that, by, by, the, at, by the end of two years of work experience, I've got a bit more confident. So I went to the, the reception. I just asked to meet the dean of the medical school. And she said, OK. The gentleman said, do you have an appointment? I said, no, I don't have an appointment, but I would like to give, I would like to see her. She said, hold on. They called the security guy called the um, office and said, speak to her. Do you know the medical school? I said, yes, I am. Um, I told him my name. I ha I'd like to um, drop a, a letter for you. She was like, OK. I said, if you don't mind. She said, I'm, I do mind. I'm thinking, uh-oh, because I'm in a meeting. I said, all right. But if you wait, I'll, I'll come down. Anyway, cut the long story short, gave her the letter. She said, well, I can't do anything. We'll have to wait for clearing because all the applications were closed now. Um, 
cut the long story short, had another had an interview there in the summer sometime. Surprisingly, she was one of my interviewers, which was good because she said, have we met before? I just smiled. So be bold and go for it if you really want to do it. So I did um, medicine in King's College and also did the integrated BSc that I mentioned earlier. And they have this um, theological associate of King's College, which is like a theological course, which I also did while I was there. That was fun and different. So after medical school, that's not the end of exams. Um, there is more exams, but that's why you have to enjoy studying or at least be right. It's a medicine's lifelong learning, training. A lot of it, for example, I was talking to someone, I said, you know, when I was in medical school, all the things we used to manage diabetes now, they didn't exist and I'm not that old. <laughs> so things are always changing, things, new things all the time, you know. So I got, I've over time got comfortable with telling patients, I'm not sure, I'm not, I don't know, I'll check it because things are changing. Um, so after medical school, then I went on to do, uh, you have the initial, what they used to call house job, but it's now called foundation training, where you do two years of some different specialties. You do just to, because they wanted more doctors to be more rounded, not just go straight into one. So, and thereafter you apply for your specialist training, and then you can train all the different specialists that I mentioned earlier. I initially started with pediatrics training in London, which was great. Um, but then along the way, um, got married. By the end, by the time I had the third ch child, I began to realize actually I don't want to spend nights in hospitals anymore. I wanted to meet the children that are at home, not just the ones on the ward. So I moved over to general practice, which has been fun because you still get to see kids and everyone. Um, so at the moment I'm, I'm working in general practice and I'm hoping to, you know, focus more on pediatric side of that or because you can have you can be a GP with specialist interests. Some people are GP, they have special interest in diabetes, so they go into that in details, or they have special interest in pediatrics, or skin, dermatology, which I didn't even put on the list, that's another specialty. Um, and that's my journey. Now, what do I enjoy about being a doctor? I think it's no two days are the same, it's different. You know, every, it's not just, you know, if you see someone with diabetes, no two people with diabetes are the same. You know, people, different, dealing with different people with their different circumstances, not just the diseases. So that's one thing I enjoy about it. It's definitely, definitely not boring. It's very interesting. Um, and be making a difference in people's lives is just amazing. I mean, it's, you know, the other thing I've throughout this COVID period, I've I'm doing I I've been doing home visits and going to people's homes and just been able to help them and whatever they you know whatever problem they have and you're able to move them forward you know help their pain help them manage these explain things to them they're scared they think that thing is a heart attack but it's not really a heart attack you can explain things to them so it's very it's very rewarding to be able to impact people's lives that way. Um, I enjoy teaching. That's something that you get to do as a as a as a doctor, actually. So that's one of the skills, because in addition to getting lectures, you 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 do a lot of your learning on the ward. Um, and as you come along, you don't have to end your training before you start teaching. As a junior doctor, you're teaching medical students that are around you. They constantly ask you the questions. You're teaching your patients about themselves, about their condition. You're teaching nurses, you're teaching, um, and as you go higher in your specialty, you're teaching other trainees coming after you. Um, the other thing which I didn't put on there is I, I also teach in the um, life support courses like to help people in stressful situations to deliver you know, what we call advanced life support. So if somebody collapsed, what are we going to do? There's training there. So you, you, there's lots of opportunity to teach. And um, 
I remember when I was really struggling to get into medical school and people asked, what if you don't get in? What are you going to do? I'm thinking, huh? But I'm going to get in. I have to get in. I don't have anything else to do. So one day I had to really stop and say, just think for a minute. What else do you want to do if you don't do medicine? And I thought, if I don't do medicine, I'm going to do teaching. I'm thinking, what? That's teaching medicine? I said, well, those are the two things I enjoy doing or that I really love to do. And then someone pointed out to me, and I think I checked it then, that do you know that the word doctor also means teacher? I said, there you go. So you're going to do a lot of teaching. You have the, you don't, well, you will have to do some of it. Um, but if you want to, you get to do a lot of it as much as you want to. Um, and also being a doctor, you can work and travel anywhere. I mean, I considered going to Australia to work, actually got a job there. Yeah, got the job offer. I didn't go in the end. Um, you know, people sometimes go to Canada, you know, you, and I mean, for, my husband's a doctor as well. He goes on like mission trips. So you can just go to different rundown areas and just offer your medical service. You, you, you may not have all the equipment and all the excellent resources, but you can still help. So it's, you can you can practice a lot when, even when you travel. That's fun. Um, what else do I enjoy? I enjoy you know being able to yes, like I said, help patients and also to help family. You know, um, sometimes a lot of my friends just call me, oh, what's this? Or you know, your parents, your siblings, you know, you can just help. And it, because it's something I enjoy doing, it's it's always a pleasure to do that. Yeah. So yeah, I think there's a lot. All the things I enjoy about medicine. I'm sure if I I'm sure I can go on for a long time, but I'll leave it on that one. So what are the downsides? I think I already alluded to one of them earlier. I'm not really a night person <laughs> because I didn't get to sleep well in the day. So the times, the, the nights, working nights, I found challenging. But if you, you know, sleep in the day and, you know, work at night because online shops and offices and, you know, investment houses a lot of places do shut at night you know but the patients don't choose not to be just to say okay i'm just going to be ill in the day i'm going to go to sleep at night people in hospital there all the time so there has to be someone there to look after them um especially with some special more with some specialty than others like medicine pediatrics um so working nights um so that's one of the downsides, but it's, 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 it's a requirement, at least during your training, you will need to do some nights, uh, which is one of the reasons I moved on to general practice as well, because of the family and to be able to have the shift pattern can be quite um, disorientating for the family. Um, the hours can be long. There has been a lot of, has been done to make the hours um, comply with the European Working Time Directive. Well, I'm not sure what we're using now, but we, EU, but Brexit, I won't even go there. But there, is, there are things in place to make it safe. Um, I think one of the things I find challenging is when you can't help. That can be tough, but at the end of the day, I'm only a doctor, I'm not a god. <laughs> so there are times when you can't help and you just need to be there and to just be honest. Um, because sometimes people don't get better and sometimes people die um, and being able to communicate that and not to worry you, you would learn, you get to practice. It gets easier, but it's still real. So I think those are the downside, but at least even when people don't make it or things don't get better, you can still be there too, just being there can be a medicine. Sometimes, you know, as doctors, you give medicine. Sometimes you are the medicine. Just being there is treatment in itself. So, so those are the, you know, the downsides um, for me. The other upside, which I didn't mention, actually, is I was, I don't really think about this, but it's job security. You know, you will always have a job. That's not why I went into it. Uh, probably why I did make it to my list. You may not, you may want to work somewhere else or do something else, but you will always have a job. 
So, um, hey, what challenges did I face in my journey? I think I've mentioned some of them. One of my challenges to start with was my confidence and timidity was really a challenge to start with. But hey, we all grow and we can all grow. Um, so I think I've talked about that already. And, and these are areas that we can, you can develop in. Um, it's really, if that's what you want to do, how bad do you want? Some people try to do it in um, uh, get great, good grades and then do A-levels. They try and try and they don't get in. Um, and then they go and do um, a different degree and come back at this postgraduate entry. Sometimes it's more difficult postgraduate because there are even fewer spaces. Some people go abroad to, to study medicine. And I think really just answering, is this what I really want to do? Definitely not for money, because <laughs> there's a whole lot you can do, especially these days that pay a lot more than medicine. So I, I wouldn't say because of job security or money, that wouldn't be a, a good enough reason. Uh, but if that's what you really want to do, for so many other reasons, some of the ones I've mentioned or not I've mentioned. Um, so, yeah, even if you think, oh, I'm quiet, I'm timid, I can't speak, my communication, I don't have all these skills you're talking about, which I'm going to mention in the next slide. They can all be learned and developed. And like I said, I have my GCSEs were not like, uh, they were not even GCSEs, they were GCE and they were not that exciting. But, you know, I was able to make up for it at A-levels um and you know overcame that um lack of experience i think one of because i i didn't um do my secondary school and grew up here i was born here went to nigeria and then came back so i didn't when people say so what do you have to offer i was thinking uh i'm not really i didn't run i didn't have any sports in ability, music ability, you know. I, so during my A-levels, I thought, OK, let me go and find something I can offer because I really want to do medicine. So I did the Duke of Edinburgh Award scheme. I was doing the bronze one at the time because I was just starting. So those are things you can do. Just whatever it is you enjoy doing, do it well, do it excellently. And you can it can be something you have to offer that would make you stand out just you know develop yourself as a person and you can learn a lot of skills doing whatever it is you do whether it's music sports um i remember one of the interviews uh i attended one of the gen gentlemen that had an interview got an offer and his offer this was a long time ago but over 10 years ago his offer was three c's i was thinking what all he needed that was his offer. Of course, he was going to get it was predicted much more than that. But the university really wanted him. Maybe he had some, I don't know, he was doing sports at a very high level or the university wanted him because they didn't just want you because of your medicine or because of your academics. What else can you bring to this to the university? If you're a potential Olympic swimmer, hey, they want to see our student, you know, did the Olympics. So whatever it is you can do, just do it well, because there's more to medical school life than just academics. And they want people to bring, you know, richness. Um, what other challenge did I face in my career? I think, like I mentioned earlier, the work-life balance, you know, trying to, it can be quite demanding. It can take all of you if you let it. So it's just learning to balance. And I think it come across if you're doing your A-levels, you're doing your GCSE, and that's not all you do. If all you have done by the time you're 18 is just got three years or even five A's, you know, drop the other two A's and just do something else that is interesting, make yourself interesting. So that's, if you can balance your sports, balance your activity, balance all the things you enjoy doing with your academics, that you're already showing, demonstrating that you would, you would be able to cope. So we've talked about some of them already. So communication, yes, important. Listening. Communication is not just about talking, listening to people, because if you listen long enough, the patient will tell you what's wrong. OK, um, empathy, really caring. So like I said, you can't just say ah, that medicine. If you do medicine, you earn thousands, you have job security. You have to really want to actually listen to people tell you about their um, 
whatever it is over and over again. Um, tell you about things you might be, you might be tired and you still want to tell you about this or that, you know. So you have to actually want to relate with people. So communicating, problem solving. You're constantly solving problems. Um, someone comes to you and tell you, I have this headache. Because people don't come like they do in the textbook. They, you know, when you read a textbook about headache, it will say they have this symptom, this symptom, this symptom, this symptoms. People just say, I've got this pain here. You start saying, mm, I'm not sure, you know. So you have to be able to take the information that you get and then make something out of it. So being able to problem solve and analyze what you're being told and what you're seeing and make you know, because otherwise how even like when I was in pediatrics, how how do you know? The baby can't even tell you what's wrong. You know, you learn on but being able to put what you're the information you're gathering from the patient, from the environment, from the mom, putting it together and making a decision and analyzing the problem. Decision making, yes, that is definitely a skill to that we need. And also, like I said, whatever is all these things here, they're skills and they can be learned. And they don't have to only be learned in medical school or in the classroom or the extracurricular activity you're doing they can help develop some of the skills that like Duke of Edinburgh Award. You know, you, you'd work in so many different areas and you be able, get the opportunity to develop some of the skills. Uh, being able to work under pressure, your know, nights, the crash blip goes off, you're running off and you have to deal with what you find. Someone collapsed, you have to deal with it, you know. So being able to work under pressure, make decision. Um, and down there is dry for cause you need to be you can't hang the books when you graduate yeah you can't fling your graduation hat in the hair and say that's it my studying is done no <laughs> your studying i've just started so you have to have the desire to learn more you know for your for yourself and for your patients you know oh doctor there was this thing online about this you know like, uh you know, at least you want to know what you know and what you don't know. <laughs> and you're always going to continue to learn. Things are always changing. Even after you've done all your specialist training, you know, even when you're in consulting, you don't want a consultant that's still practicing the medicine that was based on the research they did 15 years ago. That will not be good. So you need to be the drive to just continue to learn and to know more. Um, that's, a, that's a skill. Yeah, leadership and management, you know, that's something like I mentioned earlier with teaching and it's also leadership on the ward, helping, you know, leadership. Every team leads leaders, whether it's the, the crash team or the team on the ward, um, wherever we are. So those are skills. And like I mentioned earlier as well, academics and technical skills. Academy, which you're developing now in, in, in college, but also you're going to learn all the other skills that you see on ER or, or Grey's Anatomy, all the other skills that you need to learn, you will learn it along the way. Um, and you can, you, you know, if you want to be a surgeon, you're not going to have that skill yet. That's going to be learned. So I've mentioned how do we develop these skills? Work experience is always good. Voluntary work is great, you know. Um, even if you have to ask again, <laughs> you know, it will help you develop your communication skills. Anywhere you're relating with people, it's great. So yes, the 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 ones like St John's ambulance, you can do it in hold people's own, um, or space, or even a care. You know, like I said, care home. I, I remember then in my gap year, I was doing, a, I was working in a care home. It was actually paid. I was working in a care home, like a care assistant. I, I, I just did uh, just you know you get to relate with talking with carers talking with patients and that experience is still valuable today because now I, I still have to go back and you know I don't, you, you you learn even if you're working in a shop it's a paid job you're com you're constantly talking with people so those are skills you can you can you know bring over and learn like I mentioned your Duke of Edinburgh was another way to develop problem solving, working in a team, it's another skill. Um, you know, some of the camping and expedition you want to do with the Duke of Edinburgh, I was involved working in a team. 
and all the extracurricular activities that you're doing, you can develop skills there. Uh, I mean, if you're doing sports, you can, there's skills to be learned in working in a team, learning, persisting. The other way to develop skills and to learn is reading, reading journals, being interested in news articles, what's happening on the news about science, about science or medicine. You know, get a hang. I know some people, you know, they cut out the clippings and they keep it so that when they're going for interview, you're not like really stressed out in the last week or two weeks. You've been preparing for it all along because you've been around it. Um, rich books. I don't mean like medical textbooks, but there are like novels that you can that you can read that are around either medicine or doctor. There was a book someone mentioned. This is this is going to hurt. It's it's. I've not actually read it myself, but I, I, it's one of the ones I picked up. You just read a book to to get yourself in in the mind and see how things work. Um, yeah, like I said, make the most of every opportunity you have, whether in school or out of school. One of the things I did was I was we did like this mentoring program. I was like a pair to pair mentoring. That's communication. That's teaching, although it's not. But then you now have to extract what you're. Whatever you're doing, extract the skills from it, um, which is the last point on the slide. They say, reflect on what you do. So whatever you do, just think to yourself, what am I getting out of this? Um, you know, and how can I, how can it benefit me if I be, if I want to be a doctor? And those things will help you in writing your personal statement and developing what skills you're developing. That's all. Um, and um, if you have any questions, Mr. Dagodoro, and um, any comments. Thank, Thank you, you so me. much. Wow, that was awesome. I mean, you were very, very detailed. You've broken everything down. I mean, you took us. I mean, you took us on a journey. You know, a real deep journey into the world of medicine. And I've learned so much myself. You know, so much. You know, you really exposed us to so many knowledge in the world of medicine and. You know, uh, your experience and your story is so inspiring. You know, your resilience is so, I mean, it's very, very encouraging. And that is what I think that young people also need. You know, the fact that you didn't give up, you had a dream, you know. It's always very good for us to have that. You had a dream and you pursued that dream and you did not allow anything to stop you. So it's very important. That's a great lesson that I would like every single one of you today to take with you, you know. If you have a dream, nothing can stop you. You only can stop yourself, no matter what, you know. And it's it's so it's such a wonderful um, experience that you've just shared. It. I really thank you for that. And uh, like I said, you know, you got to study. You have to continue to study if you want to become a doctor. Knowledge for life. It's interesting. Uh, thank you so much for for. I mean, you have you've been very detailed. You shared everything that you know. I really. I mean. I mean, you've told us about what you know, what kind of uh, qualification that you would you 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 require to get into medicine and what you need to do. You know, the different work experience. You talked about work experience. You know, wonderful enough, it's something that we encourage our students to do. Uh, to always do. COVID COVID has really in that them this year, but a lot of them have become so resilient about it also, and they're having it. You know, virtual work experience, which is very very good. So thank you so much, Dr. Tolu. Really, really appreciate your, you know, taking your time out to to do this, you know, this session uh, with us today. Really, really appreciate you. Thank you very much. You're and uh, to all of you out there, you know, I wish you the very best. Like Dr. Tulu said, don't let anything stop you. It's your dream. What's your dream? What do you what 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 do you hope to achieve, you know, for your future? Nothing can stop you. You can only stop yourself. So go out there. Be the very best you can be. And like she said, whatever you find yourself doing, be the very best in it. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you. And goodbye.